So for much of the pandemic, there's been a strong belief that vaccines were going to be our way out of this, of this issue, this problem, a game changer. Survey after survey has shown enormous pent-up demand for travel, even among those who are hesitant to get the vaccine. First, the cruise ships, though, started the precedent of saying you must have a vaccine in order to board on certain sailings. And then yesterday, we took a giant leap forward when the European Union, as Peter had just mentioned, uh, said they would be welcoming vaccinated travelers from the US, uh, Israel, the UK, countries where the vaccine rollout is well advanced. But there's still many, many different approaches to opening borders, to requirements to arrive, quarantines, different amounts of time one has to have before a COVID uh, negative test is taken prior to arrival. And there's still significant concern about the variants that, are, that continue to arise. So the question I, the panel and I are going to explore is how do we rebuild confidence among travelers? And to help me explore that question, please welcome Enrique Ibera, who is the founder and CEO of City Sightseeing Worldwide. Fernando, yes. Fernando Valdez, the Secretary of State for Tourism of Spain. <laughs> Gibran Chapur, Executive Vice President of Palace Resorts and our host at the Moon Palace here. <laughs> Marian Muro, the Director General of Barcelona Tourism. <laughs> and Daniel Richards, CEO and founder of Global Rescue. Thank you. And if you uh, haven't taken your headphones out of the plastic, now might be a good time. Some of the panelists may be answering in Spanish, if you don't speak Spanish. So, uh, and again, if you have questions, uh, please do submit them through the app. So, Marianne, we're going to begin with you. So. About every article I have read, and for that matter, every article I've written about over tourism features Barcelona. And uh, with such a strong demand expected for travel's return, what is Barcelona doing to prepare and to ensure a better quality of life for residents and a better experience for visitors? Hello, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to stay here with you and to share this panel. Um, Barcelona, lleva aproximadamente... Barcelona, for one year, has been working on new strategic guidelines. Barcelona is really focusing on where the city wants to go and the objectives of this city. I always say that the pandemic that has been horrible from the human perspective and from the professional perspective, the pandemic has brought about something which is important. And I always say that it is important to think to the left of the decimal point. This means that we have had a year to reflect, to think, and to be insightful, to analyze to reflect, to set our priorities as a city, and to really focus on what matters. After many years, Barcelona has seen some strategic guidelines that are based on four pillars and that have been approved by the entire city, by the opposition, by the private sector. This is, we have reached a consensus leading to stability to the strategic guidelines. Therefore, that allows us to work safely. If you allow me, these guidelines are based on four pillars. The, f the first pillar is content. We are in the era of content, and Barcelona needs more content. Why? Because Barcelona is a living city, and Barcelona needs more content that will meet the three Ds in Spanish, decentralize, de-seasonalize, and diversify. 
and we do have the resources in order to introduce more content that complies with the four Ds. Besides content, we have marketing. Marketing is not just marketing for the sake of marketing. We want to do smart marketing. Marketing associated to promotion. This means that Barcelona, from here on, will select the markets and will select and micro-segment the, tar the targets it's going to focus on. The city will set the description and the city will show the attributes that the city wants to be known for. And what are those attributes? Gastronomy, culture, a small city, but with a territory that uh, allows you to see the Dali Museum in two hours. Also, you know, these attributes that we have to focus on and these are the attributes that we have to market to, to, to put our policies around them. And something which is important is to use digitation. This is to use digital tools in order to manage tourism. You see, Barcelona, as it has happened to other destinations that are mature, Barcelona has had an exponential growth, if you allow me. Barcelona is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I think you shall agree with me, right? But <laughs> it is true that as all destinations that are successful and mature destinations, we've been concerned more about their promotion than promotion and management. Now we are in a different stage. We're in this stage of promotion and management and digital tools will help us so that whenever a visitor comes to Barcelona, the visitor will be automatically connected to a tool that will tell the visitor how many people are there in any attractive place or the safety measures, whether there's a queue and will offer alternatives in case there's a queue or a line, will give alternatives or it will tell the tourists to go visit later on. And the city will accomplish two things. First, to give a better service to visitors. And in the second place, to give better quality of life to residents. Because we will avoid long lines. We will avoid high occupancy of public spaces. And we kill two birds with one stone, right? Well, I actually went to my, on my honeymoon to Barcelona uh, a while ago. And, uh, Are you still married? <laughs> <laughs> Two children later, yes. Uh, but the, the, the question I would have had before choosing it is after reading all these articles about overtourism, and this gets back to our question of competence, are you going to put the measures that you're making into the marketing? Are you going to be basically letting travelers know, because I'm not sure I would have chosen it, as if with all the news about how crowded it is, I'm not sure I would have chosen it. Are you going to make that part of your messaging, your marketing messaging, that this is going to be a different Barcelona? See? Yes, you're talking about the news in 2019 that ended in 2019 because 2020 everything finished but i was telling you that this year we have used the year of the pandemic to rethink what we wanted as a city we have rethought where we want to go let me give you an example i just came back from russia barcelona has been the first city of all europe that has known how to do promotion the first city that does good promotion Russia has not given visas to anyone but two tourists from Barcelona in the last year. We went to Russia last week, but because we have a strategy, we knew very well that now we have the light at the end of the tunnel, which is the vaccines and the green passport. And we destinations, we need to start doing promotion, not one day earlier. We need to go and tell markets how our destination is like, the measures we have adopted, the protocols we will be implemented. So the trip that Barcelona Tourism made to Russia, we presented the new Barcelona in Russia. A new Barcelona. I am telling you that we are the ones that are positioning our attributes. 
we are controlling our narration, our narrative. We don't want to tell the number of people that come. That's not what matters. But as I said, there are destinations. Barcelona and Venetia are always compared. You know why? You know why? Because there are cities in the world, I can tell you many more famous cities, for example, that have a larger density than the density in Venice and Barcelona that have tourism in a very little space. Therefore, all visitors gather in the same areas. But you can go to any city in the United States or from any other country or Asian city. You can go there. And depending on the season of the year, you cannot even cross the street because everything is so crowded. But that happens in specific places because the densities of those destinations are much bigger than the densities in Barcelona. So we are working on that. We have come up with new strategic lines. And I invite you all, because what matters is for you to go and see it yourself, right? So I hope you will be coming to Barcelona. Not all at the same time, of course, but please come to Barcelona. We will there waiting for you with open arms so that you can see that Barcelona will be a sustainable Barcelona, a Barcelona where we will have the warmth of all the people, of the locals, and that locals want tourists to come and to feel comfortable and safe. Uh, Enrique, you, you, with your tours, are all around. It's worldwide, is in your title. So you're seeing there's obviously some that are closed off. But of the ones that are opening, uh, what are you seeing in terms of booking patterns that might give insight into where demand is greatest? Uh, you know, are there certain cities that really seem to be uh, doing well? Uh, and uh, what does that tell us about the traveler of the future? Well, uh, first of all, uh, hello. Hello, good, evening, good afternoon to everyone. Hello, Gloria. Congratulations for organizing this event in these strange times. Wonderful. And well, what we are seeing, uh, the main trends we see from travelers that we've seen during the past 11 months of the pandemic and what we see for the future, I would summarize them in four of them actually. You know? uh, we see travelers, uh, the main concern today about technology and sustainability, that those trends, we see them as uh, we were working on them in the pre-COVID times, you know? But then there are some other, two, there are other two trends. Talking about technology, the travelers, we see that they demand a very digital uh, travel experience, so they want a contactless and seatless uh, travel journey starting from the beginning, from the research to the booking to the redemption. When they leave home, they want to have that journey, that travel experience in the transfer, the planes or the boats. When they arrive in the destination, they want to have that digital experience. As a matter of fact, we've been working really hard during these times and since pre-COVID in this, and then we develop a QR code technology that allows our customers not only to use our services uh, without any contact, but also to add on into that QR code any other attractions, any other museums and activities in the city so they can go and use it the same way just by scanning at the door. That avoids them actually for them to be in queues. That also uh, help them to be a so to keep the social distance. And what is very important, allow us to track where they go around. So I think that that development of technology, it's something that everyone in the industry has to embrace. We're, I have to say that during this pandemic, uh, people that were less tech savvy, they have embraced technology because they started to follow any news about the pandemic. They started to shop about it. 
So they're going to be more friendly to any technology that we put out there. No? If we talk about sustainability, as I said, it's something that we were seeing before, but now it has completely changed. The traveler, they see sustainability uh, with a lot more into their travel plans, and they don't want just to demand destinations that they care about the sustainability of the destination, but also they want to use suppliers, they want to see attractions, that they also care about this sustainability. They feel part of it. As a matter of fact, I think that today, like uh, Matthew, I believe he said before, uh, sustainability should not be an annex, uh, appendix in a company. From my point of view, it should be in the center of the strategy of development of the company. That's really important today. Another of the trends that we are seeing is the development or, or, or the new demand that we are seeing, no? the evolution of the demand. Mainly during those months, during this month, we've seen travelers uh, not going very far from home, traveling mainly in their own country domestically. And we have even seen in some locations, some destinations where we operate, citizens, let's say, traveling or doing tourism in their own cities, which is very important mm. because that's something that before it was very difficult to see. Actually, when we realized that people were tending to do that, we created some uh, packages, we bundled some product with other monuments, museums and all that, and we marketed it just to the citizens, the local of that uh, destination. And the feedback, the, the product were very successful and the feedback that we got from them that it was very important, they were telling us that they learned a lot more about their, their culture, their heritage and everything because they always think about traveling and doing tourism outside. So I believe that that was uh, really important. No? Also, we can see that uh, people, uh, they want to travel fewer trips, but they want longer stays. I think they are looking for unique experiences. They want to be doing less trips, but in those trips, they want to take most of it. Also, we have seen, well, nomad travel. We see every day more people since the way of working have changed so much. People working from home, they can work from, need to go to the office. So we have seen an increase of people coming to the destination and they come there not for a, for a, a short stay. They will be there for months, you know? And I think that's something that it will remain because it's gonna be very difficult for companies to bring back uh, everyone, you know? They realize that they can work like that, so that will stay also. And then uh, the fourth uh, trend, uh, really important, the health and hygiene uh, requirements and demand that we are getting from customer, from traveler. It's key. It has become a paramount in the industry. I believe that uh, actually WTTC has done a great job with the protocol, with the safe uh, travel stamp. And that's something that is giving a lot of confidence to the travelers. But something that the public sector and the private sector need to have in mind, need to be very careful, is that we need to find the balance in between those uh, health and hygiene protocols and the customer experience, okay? We, it's very important that those uh, protocols, they cannot affect the customer experience because then travelers will stop traveling, you know? And we have seen that already, some example, for example, when countries announce the quarantines uh, on uh, arrival and return and all that, so uh, it really hurt, it really hurt the, the, the industry because people will stop traveling with people, the booking engine, it completely stopped, no? But we've seen also some good example, like last Christmas, right before Christmas, that I traveled to Dubai when they opened the corridor in between UK and Dubai. 
we could see with a very easy way to enter into the country with a PCR. If you didn't bring it to you, they will do it right away in the airport. You will go to the hotel and wait for the result. So that was a very good experience for all travelers. As a matter of fact, I believe that Dubai went up to 80% of the numbers that they had in 2019. So we have to take in consideration that, that we need to keep always the balance in between the, 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 the health and hygiene protocols and the customer experience. Thank you, Enrique. And, and Dan, you, you get a different sort of insight into what's on travelers' mind because your program is kind of part insurance, part assistance, but when people call your call centers and, and are curious about it, what are they curious to know? What are the questions that they still are unsure about that they feel you might be able to help? What are those concerns? Well, thank you, Arnie. You know, there really are two things, I think, that need to be solved for demand to really return. But before I get into that, I, I just think we all have to keep in mind that the traveler and travelers are incredibly resilient. And people right now want to travel more than they've ever wanted to travel in modern history. So there is an enormous amount of pent-up demand, and it just needs to be given the opportunity to express itself. And if we do two things, we need to remove fear from the equation, and we, uh, we need to remove uncertainty. And those are two uh, related but different things. So we're about to enter an environment where the majority of, for instance, in the United States, of people are vaccinated. You know, we're at 230 million people have received at least one shot. Nearly 100 million, a little over actually 100 million, um, are fully vaccinated at this point. The United States is going to be done vaccinating here in the next four to six weeks, which will, which will be great. So we'll have 330 million travelers uh, from the U.S. who are ready to, to go again. Um, so you just have to remember that your, your customer at that point is going to be a vaccinated individual. Um, but when you talk about removing fear, so you need to remove the fear that people are going to actually get the disease and then have potentially an adverse outcome. So the second part of that is, well, if I do get sick or I do have a problem somewhere, how do I get out? How do I get home? I mean, that's the natural human instinct. How do I get to the place that's most comfortable to me where I can get the care that I need? Um, and so, you know, global rescue companies like ours, we solve those problems for people. We remove that, uns you know, that, that uncertainty and that fear. But what we can't do, to the second part of what I said, is to remove the uncertainty of the travel experience, right? That's beyond certainly anyone in the private sector's control. That goes to governments to set, you know, reasonable rules regarding how travel can occur. And if we can get some uh, level of, um, you know, coordination among governments so that when travelers start to book that trip or start talking about it, they don't, you know, get to the, you know, the screen that then shows them what they need to do in order to actually get from point A to point B. I mean, it's hard enough if you're an individual. Now imagine, you know, if you're a family with young children, um, it becomes very, very challenging. So you have to remove that uncertainty and you have to guarantee them that they're not going to get stuck in quarantine somewhere for some long period of time. Again, as an individual adult, uh, unpleasant but bearable. If you have young children and you're traveling you know, voluntarily, who would want to subject themselves to that and your children to that? Most families would not. So we need to remove that from the equation. And again, the private sector, companies like ours, we can solve that. We can go in, we can, you know, we can evacuate people, we can put them on private jets, we can get them home, we can move them. If they're sick, we put them on medevac aircraft, we can do all those things. But we can only do it within the constraints that are elaborated in, and dictated by the government uh, environments um, in which we operate. So if we can do those two things, I, I will guarantee you that demand will come surging back. Okay, well, Fernando, this is a perfect segue to you. So you were present during the discussions, during the debates in February uh, around this. Europe was notoriously unable to coordinate border openings. So this is, is tremendous. What was the breakthrough? What was it that the tourism-dependent countries said to those who said, I've got other priorities? What was it that maybe others can benefit from knowing? What are the magic words to get people to say, OK, we're going to do this. Let's welcome vaccinated travelers. 
Thank you. Thank you, Arnie, and thank you, WTTC, for, for bringing us together again. Thank you, Gloria. Well, I think it was, it was a natural debate. I've, I've been listening some conversation along, along these days, and, and we realized that since the beginning, this is a, this is a health crisis. We, we, we really need uh, to realize that the beginning of this was, uh, was uh, a virus, which is true. The, the principal uh, problem was in terms of mobility and, and travel and uh, tourism sector. But it was, a cri it was a crisis related with health. So it is natural that since the beginning, it was, it was a balanced uh, conversation between health authorities and those uh, who realize that we have enough means to start uh, recuperating the, the activity. So what happened in February was that, uh, OK, we, we did then have the vaccines. And we start seeing that there were countries uh, that tourism it was not really as important uh, as for Spain or other countries. And we start realizing that we really need to push forward the debate. And since we do have vaccines. Which, and if you, which were the countries that were pushing this agenda? Well, the ones, actually, the ones that we, we really uh, understand that tourism is part, uh, uh, an important part of our GDP. I mean, it was Spain, Portugal, Greece, Italy. Uh, we were the ones realizing that uh, mobility of persons, not only of goods, but of persons, uh, it was the right time to move forward and try to uh, put in place all the means uh, to, to make it happen, to make it happen, because we do have vaccines, and that's a completely different scheme from last summer. I think when someone says we are at the same position as la of last summer, I, I don't agree. I think we are in a completely different situation, and we were then in February. So it was time to put in place means to give certainty, as, as Dan said. I think the best thing that governments right now can provide to travelers is certainty, give the, the proper information and the security that they can travel and they can come back to the countries knowing what can they expect. And in those terms, in the European Union, we put in place a system, because of that discussion on, on late February, that provides us with a digital certificate. Digital certificate is not a, a magical wound, it's just certainty. I mean, what we are providing travelers is a mean of uh, uh, security in the terms of how to uh, well organize their travel. So they know that if they're vaccinated, they do a test or they're immunized, they can, they can travel. And what we do need to put in place now is uh, this certificate to, to start negotiating with third countries. Yesterday news was excellent because we, uh, we realized that uh, US citizens which, is, uh, which are vaccinated can go to, to the European Union. And I think this kind of news are going to, to be consistent along the way. Spain is going to be ready in June uh, to use this digital certificate. We are doing a pilot program on May in all our 46 airports. So we are going to give all travelers this certainty. Spain is going to be ready in June uh, to tell all travelers worldwide that you can visit us with all these means of certainty. Uh, that's that's uh, wonderful. What's, what's unusual, I guess, on the world stage is that this was done, it was multilateral within Europe, but unilateral to the rest of the world. Do you expect re rep reciprocity? Rep oh, I'm going to blow it. You know what I mean. Yeah. yeah I if, uh, are you going to expect that other countries are going to likewise say vaccinated travelers from Europe are welcome? Well, I think this, this has to be He's, this has to come in a natural way. Uh, since we are accepting uh, 
a common standard and, and standards also Dan mentioned it this is this is very important to all of us it is of no use that we open w only one side of the of the equation I mean I if we only use this this certificate but if you come back to your country and the restriction is not they're not certain they could change from one day to another this this is no, not going to help uh, tourism right. so what we are expecting with uh, with our negotiations between the eu and uh, and third countries is that since we have done this uh, system which is quite i have to say is uh, is uh, quite uh, uh, simple in its use and we we are not interested on data on the users i mean what we want is that someone that has the vaccination certificate that is related with uh, with their identity and they can prove that there is no risk in their travel but when they're coming back to the country this has to have a kind of reciprocity as you mentioned yes, yes. thank you reciprocity <laughs> So, uh, Gibran, you, you are the only one on this panel who actually has been experience, has experience with travelers for uh, any length of time since Mexico has been open. What do you think are the three factors that are the key to rebuilding confidence from what you've noticed in terms of the travelers who've come to Mexico? Well, thanks, Arnie. Um, this is one of the largest hotels in the world, and when we decided to open the chain, we weren't sure if we should open the small hotels rather than large hotels, because we didn't know if the clients were gonna decide uh, to stay in a crowded property rather than a, than a small one. So uh, what we did in the beginning was to create a very clear video of the protocols that we're gonna be following uh, this was in June, uh, almost a year from now, and I can tell you that in our website, the, the protocol video, uh, the Purely Palace, uh, was much more visited than the promotions section of the webpage. People care much more about the health and safety and protocols rather than a discounting price, which, by the way, we didn't discount because people won't travel for a discount if they're afraid of their health. They don't care if you give it for free. So, so this was very important to have a clear communication. And I also think that a very organized industry, locally or nationally, uh, give a one sole message on how our protocols being followed by destination, on the airport, uh, in, in different hotels. And I think in Quintana Roo uh, and in Los Cabos, I can tell you that the industry was very well organized in terms of having uh, the same protocols per se and this created a very big confidence in the client because the, the, one of the problems that we have seen is that the messages to travel are not clear. Do I need a PCR test, an antigen test to go in, to go back three days, uh, four days, what happens if I am uh, vaccinated, what happens if I'm not? So, so a clear communication is uh, very important. I'm glad Spain is doing that. I think it's very intelligent. Um, and also the word of mouth, it's clue. I can, I can do a survey today and hopefully all of you will be feeling very safe on being here. Uh, and, and what difference is it to be in a supermarket grabbing a tomato with somebody that has not been tested to grab a tomato and then you come and grab the same fruit uh, what's the difference between that and going on a trip? Maybe the only thing and the only process that could be uh, or could make the client be nervous is the airplane. Uh, I believe that the vaccinated people should have a green light and the non-vaccinated people should get a 10 minute quick test before getting on a, on a flight, independently if it's on a way in or, in or out, because you're sitting next to a guy that is sneezing for nine hours and your your brain will make you sick even yeah. if he doesn't have COVID. <laughs> so um, I, I believe that confidence is uh, coming. I, I, I can tell you from our sales that the clients want to travel. Just last week, and, and Alex mentioned that in his panel, 
last week we sold 50 percent more year We have seen it from the U.S. The U.S. clientele to, to Quintana Roo, it's uh, growing up to a point that it's about to surpass uh, travelers from January and February from sure that every uh, enjoy their lives and I believe uh, also the travel is something that has taken relevancy in terms of uh, what why do I want a new pair of shoes or a new watch a rather experience more than start spending in material things. Okay. So, thank you. I've got 41 seconds and a message saying, please start wrapping up in one question. Gibran, how can you motivate someone to do uh, meetings again? Can you answer in 30 seconds? You've got a lot of meeting space. Uh, it, the mo we don't need to motivate because the sales are there. They're picking up. Uh, they're picking up from September and towards the first queue of the year. And I can tell you that last week we closed uh, nine groups of 3,500 rooms for six nights each, where we're going to uh, be a full buyout. And when this company that purchased the rooms from us, they sold these events, I cannot give uh, more details, in four minutes. Amazing. People are desperate to travel. Amazing. And you did well on the timing. <laughs> Thank you, panel. Um, so what we heard here was that travel will come roaring back. We're seeing it here at the Moon Palace Resorts already. If